what are the 23 most effective things we could do to reduce inequality in this country? Instead of 23, give us three. Uh, let me let me sort of categorize it uh, them because I I think that the important thing to recognize is when you have something that's grown to the size that it has over so many years there's no magic bullet there's nothing you're going to do one thing that's going to 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 solve the problem one of the things that I do emphasize though is that um, the inequality that we have is to a large extent, as I said, a result of our policies. It's a result of structures, our economic structures. So, for instance, if we have an uncompetitive market, monopoly power, that results in the monopolist making a lot of money and everybody else having to pay higher prices and lowers their income. An evidence of that kind of market power not only, we all know about market power, you know, your choice of how many t, uh, cable TV firms that you have, that's an example of monopoly, how many cable, uh, how many cell phone companies, you know, all these, there may be one, maybe two, maybe three, uh, but not very many, and all that means that there's monopoly power. But at the aggregate level, one of the striking things in the United States is American workers have been getting more and more productive Productivity, average productivity of American workers over the last 40 years has doubled. That's an achievement. What's happened to average wages? Stagnated. In a normal economy, when productivity goes up, so do wages. And that had been true in the United States and in most other countries until 1980. And then all of a sudden, things started to change. And that's one of the reasons is more, less curbing of that kind of monopoly power. And there are a whole set of provisions of, you know, bankruptcy laws, corporate governance, um, and another example, CEO pay has gone from 30 times the average workers to average 300 to one. And some firms are 1,000 to one. Joe, Without, do, do, do you believe that raising the minimum wage will destroy the American economy? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, 70% of Americans believe that it would be a good thing to, to uh, raise the minimum wage. Let me put it a slightly differently. Do I really believe, you know, the minimum wage today is lower than it was 45 years ago. Do I believe that at the bottom there's been no increase in productivity for a half a century? I just don't believe that. And the fact that almost on a whim, McDonald's one day say, oh, by the way, I'm going to increase my, my minimum, my wages by a dollar. Walmart says a similar thing. The stock price doesn't go down. In fact, you know, it just says that uh, they have enormous amount of power to set the wage. You know, I don't want to say we, if we raised it to $90 an hour, that'll be a problem. <laughs> But what we're talking about, raising it to 10, 10, or 12, or 15, Australia has a minimum wage of $15 an hour. And, uh, you know, cities all over the United States are experimenting, and what they're finding over and over again, there's not a loss of jobs. Used to be, 40 years ago, the people getting the minimum wage were our teenagers. You know, it was a teenage job. <laughs> Today, the minimum wage is increasingly held by the primary earner in the family. Can you imagine, you know, just to think about $7 an hour, you're working a full-time job, that's $14,000 pay. Can you support in New York City a family on $14,000? And you just try to imagine that. And even if you have two earners, it would be hard. But one earner supporting two children on $14,000, it just... It, Survival is, is really the question. How do you feel about that man that's going to pay his workers, everybody in his company, $70,000 a year? But 70? 70,000. Uh, which company is that? I, anybody remember the name of the company? Privately held company. He's going to cut his own uh, 
salary. He's going to cut profits in half, but he's going to pay every full-time worker 70000 a year. Well, I think actually his productivity will go up. There's a whole theory that actually I helped to develop called the efficiency wage theory, which says if you treat your workers well, they become more productive. There was a famous American entrepreneur who actually said the same thing. I don't know if you remember who it was. Henry Ford. And Henry Ford inve uh, talked about the $5 a day. That was back then. Uh, and he got more productivity out of his workers by paying them a decent wage. It was decent for those days. And it, and it worked. So I think you know these are all examples of of structure, but I wanted to finish giving the other two parts of the answer to the question. So one of them is all these kinds of laws, corporate governance, uh, uh, the legal framework of our country. That's important because a lot of the discussion focuses on redistribution. I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to tax people who speculate at a lower rate than people who work hard for a living. You know, speculating may be hard. You're talking about capital gains tax. Yeah, the fact that we, we, we have a tax on capital gains that is much lower than tax on ordinary income. You know, they say, well, it's really important for economy to invest, yes, but it's also really important for people to work. Uh, you know, so, so I don't want to uh, uh, say one is, you know, the basic thing, there is no economic evidence that that preferential treatment leads to higher growth, more savings, better investment. Uh, it just increases inequality. It is one of the reasons that we, you know, we, we have a regressive tax system. You know, people say, uh, the people at the top one-tenth of one percent are paying half the tax rate of people who are, have a much lower income. Uh, Mitt Romney and Warren Buffett talked about paying tax rates that were less than 15%. And that was 15% on their reported income. Um, <laughs> you can figure out what I'm saying here. Uh, but there's a, even a part of the legal unreported income, which is when you have capital gains, you only pay taxes when you realize the income. And if you pass on the asset to your children, there's this provision which is called a step-up basis. No tax is ever paid on that capital gain. It, goes, it has a tax rate of zero. So you get to postpone the taxes and I don't want to say people die to avoid the taxes, but if you do die, you pass it on to your children, there is no tax due.